All right, uh, welcome to the KCP community meeting, July 27th, 2021. Uh, we did not have a meeting last week. Um, I was I was out, what was, anyway, I don't remember, uh, but we didn't have a meeting last week. Uh, in the ensuing two weeks, we've had some conversations sort of uh, uh, offline in various uh, groups about um, Part of the best way to proceed. One of the, one of the ways that one of those conversations is with Michael Elder, who's here, who um, is from the Open Cluster Management and and Red Hat ACM. OCM is Open Cluster Management. ACM is Advanced Cluster Management. Is that correct? Um, uh, team at Red Hat and um, basically, I mean, we 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 have been talking, and he. Uh, the OCM uh, community and organization and project have have trod some of these paths before. Um, some of the things that OCM does are different than what KCP plans to do, but some are very similar. Uh, in particular, going over the architecture of OCM, the cluster registration process is quite a lot better than what we have in KCP today. I mean, I think we know KCP is not like the cluster registration is kind of bad. Um, but uh, OCM has a really good one, and I think we could learn a lot from it. They also have interesting models for describing where, like, here is a deployment, here's where to put it, um, I guess, uh, and, and how to pass that down to the cluster. There's, they don't just send the deployment down, they send it in like an envelope uh, object. So uh, I guess, Michael, I will pass it off to you. I don't know if that was a good overview or uh, summary of, of OCM slash OCM versus KCP, but I guess sure, get away absolutely. Okay. So, thank you so much for the opportunity as well, just to come and chat. Let me start to share. I'm going to share a couple of things to try to help help the conversation. And certainly, if you have questions, feedback, etc., as we go through, interrupt and uh, and we'll dive in from there. So I think my screen should be in the sharing process now. Okay. So first off, maybe just a quick uh, 10,000 foot level. Why am I here? What's the objective for today? Um, what do we want to get, get across? I just wanted to come and talk about what we're doing at Open Cluster Management. I wanted to explore some of the concepts that are there where I think there is some complementary or overlapping capability that might help accelerate some of the goals of KCP. So I'll explain a little bit about the Open Cluster Management project. And then I wanted to walk through some of the concepts that I think are useful. I'll try to put them in context of KCP. So bear with me just a minute. I'm, I'm going to talk about Open Cluster Management. And then I'm going to try to use that context to talk about how it, it might be interesting to explore integration between KCP and Open Cluster Management or evolving some of what's in Open Cluster Management to better support the use cases in KCP. We can dive into some uh, command line examples of a uh, Open Cluster Management hub, managing a fleet of clusters if we want to get more concrete on, the, on those examples. So first off, Open Cluster Management. This is a project that has originated from Red Hat. We have been engaging in open community meetings about every other week, going back to just before the beginning of the year. We have been engaging Ant Group, Ant Financial Group, uh, some Ali Cloud, and then most recently Tencent in contributing and getting engaged in the community. So while it was started by Red Hat, we're beginning to see other vendors also participate in, the, in those community contexts, in those community meetings. The objective of Open Cluster Management uh, is to provide a way that we can understand an entire fleet and to address the problems that we typically see an operator or an orchestrator has to address in order to become multi-cluster aware. It is a different scope of problem than I think what KCP is really going after. Open cluster management is very much a white box capability. We're layering a set of APIs that we expect cluster administrators or fleet administrators um, other roles that are specific to application release automation or roles that are specific to governance and compliance, all would, would basically be amplified on top of their existing behaviors for individual clusters through what's in open cluster management. And so that's a very different goal set than one where KCP is providing a 
a more developer centric facade on top of you know this this closed box idea of, of how we actually get code running somewhere. So from there, let me you know ultimately our goal is to multi cluster all the things. And if we look at what is in the project, and first off, just also context, we have already submitted this to the CNCF as a sandbox project. There is another uh, proposed project in a similar domain around Karmata, which is an entry from Huawei in this space. There are some concepts that, that are consistent between what's in Karmata and what's in open cluster management, but there's no formal intent to align or organizational alignment in that today, but just be aware that they've also submitted a CNCF project proposal as well. But if we look at what's in open cluster management, there are capabilities that focus on inventory, work scheduling, work distribution, and things like RBAC. And as a whole, open cluster management is trying to bring together other projects that need multi-cluster capability and to create a way that we can integrate many um, orthogonal problems, like I need to manage health of clusters, I need to deliver applications to clusters, I need to manage compliance of clusters. We want to manage those aspects in a more consistent way. So instead of having each project build a one-off approach to fleet management and then having a consumer understand, well, how does Thanos understand the fleet differently than how Argo understands the fleet? We want to provide one common API that any project can integrate with and give consistency to consumers, to the users of that API. And so if we look at what are those sort of four dimensions that, that at least I believe, and I think within the project, believe anytime that you want to take something and make it multi-cluster aware, let's say Argo for GitOps, Submariner for networking, or maybe Istio as a service mesh. So three examples that are that certainly have some related use cases, but have very different concepts that are that they're trying to provide to users. Each of these ultimately needs a way to think about first off the inventory of available clusters, and <clears throat> open cluster management defines a open cluster management.io API domain, and within that there is a manage cluster API kind that ultimately represents the inventory of available clusters which are running an agent that is connected into a hub. Then we need a way to assign desired applications or configuration to some part of that set of clusters. There's an API kind around placement. To some extent, you can almost think about placement as describing a uh, like a SQL select, right? It's going to describe a set of conditions that are evaluated against the available clusters and a set of decisions are generated, which can then be used by any multi-cluster aware orchestrator in order to say, look, I need to go configure this part of my uh, submariner capability on cluster one and five so that they can establish a network mesh. I need to configure this aspect of uh, Prometheus so that it sends data back to my centralized Thanos. So placement lets us you know, begin to actually have a controller select a specific set of subset of clusters and, and begin to match work against them. The third use case, we look at how do we actually distribute configuration. This is very consistent with KCP's notion of a sinker, uh, but it's implemented in a different way. So the goal of manifest work is simply to uh, assemble a set of parts, a set of Kubernetes API objects that are reconciled and applied to a target cluster. If I delete the manifest work API kind, the corresponding objects will get removed from the target cluster. This is today a pole centric model. An agent known as a clusterlet on the target cluster is calling back into the hub, seeking desired manifest work that need to be applied, reconciling those on managed cluster and reporting status and feedback to the hub. Was it applied successfully? Is there a conflict? Dot, dot, dot. And then finally, one of the key aspects is how do we make the management of a fleet consumable to a organization? And a lot of that has to deal with how do you express RBAC? How do I express, I want this team of human beings 
to be able to consume and access this collection of clusters. And so there's a concept introduced as managed cluster set. The term cluster set is intentionally derived from work that's in SIG multi-cluster, but managed cluster set, to some extent, you can think about, you can oversimplify as a project type of construct or a namespace construct that the only thing that goes in it are cluster related things. Strictly speaking, that includes managed cluster, but also because we are focused on provisioning life cycles for OpenShift, we also have a way to assign content from Hive, including things like uh, Hive cluster deployment, which is an object that represents a provisioned OpenShift cluster, uh, Hive cluster pool, which is a self-service concept that's part of Hive. Those things are more about, I create the cluster and I can assign it to this managed cluster set. And now if I add a user or a team to the managed cluster set, the reconciler will automatically make sure that everything in the set is available to that user or that group. Now, these are sort of the four primary value statements that we think differentiated over other approaches in the community today, because it's not necessarily trying to be the only way that you federate all the things, but it's trying to be an underpinning um, core capability that can be consumed by other projects to become multi-cluster aware. So, Michael, I'll pause One here. thing I wanted, one, one thing I wanted to note is actually, I'm like, this is good to see this laid out because it actually, I think, helped me think about like what, like manifest work is an, a concept that allows things that don't exist inside of a cube-like space mm -hmm. to be brought into a cube-like space and then transposed to other cube-like spaces. And I think that's, it's actually really useful to go through this here because I think that's the difference in one part of when we've talked about transparent multi-cluster is like the approach is you have things that may not live anywhere that can be mm -hmm. transformed from a multitude of sources into a set of work that has to be translated out. Um, one of the things that I want the KCP side to explore is very much the idea that those manifests are already cube-like objects and in their innate sense, they are transformed without going, like they don't have to be collected from sources because they're already in the source. Doesn't mean manifest work may not be useful for them, but mm -hmm. there's less, there's no requirement for them to be collected from external sources. Like that's an external problem. So you could actually see manifest work existing on the left side of a transparent multi-cluster pipeline, or you could see it being used on the right side. But I think that would be like, that's actually a really useful distinction. It's the idea that it's not about transforming arbitrary sources. There's already an API source object that gets one-to-one -one mapped or one-to-end mapped. Mm -hmm. um, so working, through, like it, maybe like there's a terminology gap here is like, what's the concept that underpins manifest work? Is it, you know, manifest retrieval, transformation and application? And then we should be able to talk about like the difference between what happens if you don't want there to be a a separate transformation, or maybe not transformation, a separate uh, input phase or something. So I'll show you, I'll just dive in and, and show a little bit of an uh, example here. Uh, here is a list of manifest work objects that are used to distribute configuration to a set of clusters that I have under management. And in this case, let me pick on, let me pick on, we have a, manifest work object that delivers a component that provides search. So if I look at the details for this, what I'm gonna see is a list of manifests that I want to be deployed on the target cluster. These are Kubernetes uh, CRDs. Uh, they can be core kind or extended CRDs. The manifest work can deliver controllers that run or can even package up and deliver the CRD definition to a target cluster. And then I can configure instances of that CR in order to drive other behavior. And then I can see the status of when the manifest work object, all of its children were successfully applied, demonstrating that they're happy and available, and then kind of go from there. And if there's a problem, that'll get reported back here as well. It, it's an envelope. It's a uh, it's a yes, payload envelope delivery. exactly. Yeah. Have and Michael, I know we talked about this a while ago. 
How many other projects in the ecosystem do you think are doing things with envelopes that could be aligned? Like how, how much, how many others out there are doing envelopes and is there a, are there commonalities between them that we could do more of? Cause like, yeah, like the envelope world and the non-envelope world, uh, figuring out ways that we could align the envelope world and the non-envelope world and then align them at key points would be like a great ecosystem like enablement kind of thing. Sure, like where sure. do these APIs break down? Where are people giving you feedback that they don't want to do stuff like this, et cetera? Well, let me let me maybe do this. Let me set the context for manifest work as an object that a user could define. Right. A user can stand it up and apply it and it'll get distributed out uh, to a fleet. And we can also build additional higher level abstractions that leverage manifest work to accomplish a goal. So I'll come back to this, this picture in just a minute, but I'll show another abstraction, which is a policy. A policy represents a desired set of configuration along with compliance and categorization data that's used to understand how this technical requirement maps back into a data standard for security. So how it maps into the PCI DSS data standard or the uh, NIST 0853 or 190 data standards. Ultimately, a policy itself is like, an, it, well, it, it is an envelope, but it has additional metadata around it. And what it reports back could be a notion of whether the cluster is considered compliant or non-compliant and a user can define and interact with this type of envelope. Another abstraction that's available is something called a subscription. And subscriptions really are a way of doing GitOps or a way of applying configuration from like an object store bucket if you're not sourcing it from GitHub. And so the subscription basically points to, here's where to go get the files that I want to deliver to my fleet. And then it's using this placement concept, which I'm going to talk about in a little more detail in just a moment. And then under the covers, generates the required objects that get synchronized out to the managed cluster fleet. So the reason that I point this out is that subscription itself doesn't require the user to add all of the child objects into an envelope. The subscription can actually just point to a GitHub repo and say, go fetch the customization YAML, go fetch the Helm charts, go fetch just a raw directory of Kubernetes objects, and then deliver them out. If I look at one of the subscriptions, subscriptions have a concept of how they link to the placement. So if I say, uh, let me fetch the subscriptions for one of these. And have the right name here. And part of the subscription object, if I get to the actual payload, the payload here is very simple. Reference a source, this ties back to a GitHub repo, and then reference the placement rule, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. And then under the covers, historically, it's not actually generating a manifest work object because manifest work evolved along a uh, parallel horizon. But conceptually, it would generate a manifest work had we built subscriptions after we built manifest work. We actually kind of reversed into manifest work from other use cases. But I show you this because here's an example of something that's not in itself strictly an envelope. It is a pointer and a binding to a placement. But under the covers, the controller can package up the children from GitHub, maybe inject them with templatized values, parameters, whatever and then ultimately create the manifest work. And then the agent is synchronizing that manifest work envelope to a set of clusters. Yeah, and, and I actually yep. think that's another good, that's another good like thing to tease apart is um, which constructs are orthogonal or not. And one of the, you know, like any point in time you make an API, you pick a set of things that are orthogonal sort of things that aren't. Sometimes those are hit by the implementation. Sometimes those are right there in the API. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that, like in a lot of respects, there's similarities between manifest work and templates as they were originally envisioned. And so um, there's the idea that 
there is a set of objects that should exist. And then um, there's an ownership of the fields in them. So like the manifest work owns all the spec fields and mm -hmm. maybe doesn't ignore, but let's say for the sake of argument, like status is ignored. And then the manifest work, it, does manifest work today, do you have a pipeline step after manifest work in the cluster lit or no? Uh, not a, not like a transformation pipeline. Today, manifest work is applied literally as it's packaged in the envelope. So children of the manifest work are applied literally as they're packaged. We have talked about making it a template, which would make it more akin to a template, to an OpenShift template, but we just haven't, haven't built that yet. We generally it, it, expect that the controller uh, that is say, so let's pick on an example like uh, like Submariner. One of the multi-cluster operators that is part of advanced cluster management understands this API from open cluster management and the things for Submariner. And that operator will look at a set of placement objects. It will decide okay, what clusters do I want to create a network mesh around? And then it'll generate the appropriate manifest work objects so that the Submariner operator gets deployed. So the OLM subscription gets pushed out to say the three clusters that it's going to configure. Then it'll generate a manifest work for the CR uh, so that the configuration that the Submariner operator is using on each of the three clusters is properly configured. And then it'll share the relevant information technically with the broker in order for these three clusters to establish an IPsec mesh, network mesh, so that they have visibility among themselves. And so that's an example where you've got a controller that wants to orchestrate a multi-cluster configuration of Submariner, and it does so by generating the appropriate manifest work, which get reconciled against the set of clusters to establish this multi-cluster network mesh. That example is also true for Thanos, where we're basically configuring health management. It's true for some work we're doing upstream with Argo, but that's a distinction where, to me, that's the type of overlap that we would see with things like the splitter concept. And I'll show another picture of that in a minute, but let me make sure that this, this flow of concepts makes sense. Yeah, and that's a good, so I think, yeah, it's like, I, I think what we're we're not concrete enough on is like, um, the transparent multi-cluster idea and how it's actually materialized, like the implementation is kind of hazy because we're still working on more of the discussion points around what the inputs would be. But like mm -hmm. as an example, um, manifest work is a synchronous materialization of a, of a plan. And then it also is a coordination point for each individual cluster to check in on. Conversely, if you want to do some deep transformation of that, you'd have to figure out how to represent what the transform is. But you could you could put a transformation pipeline after the manifest work step, for instance. Um, then there's the question of what if you actually want to, and I think this is kind of where we're, we haven't yet gotten far enough to say, but it'd be like when you want to blur the lines actually between different clusters, there is no hub cluster in some mental ways of thinking about like, KCP, like there is no KCP instance. You don't talk to a KCP instance. You just look at a mm -hmm. bunch of clusters and make a decision from those APIs. But the mindset would be like, you could move manifest work at any point. Like, it, you know, something could generate a set of manifest work and keep a synchronous uh, thing. There might be some scaling limits to that, but they don't, they don't fundamentally break the idea. But I think each part of the pipeline, and maybe like there'd be a great way, maybe what we should do is actually have a visual of this pipeline, which is you've got controllers looking at policy objects generating manifest work, and then you assume that the manifest work cluster lit pair well. There's another way of doing it, which is a transformation to the left of the controllers might actually be on the right and replace cluster lit with controller. And then that controller, and that's like kind of how like that's one way to think about the splitter and the sinker that we're not really exploring yet, but you could imagine mm -hmm. a controller living on an individual cluster, looking at 50 input clusters and synthesizing that into a manifest work. It's not a, like there's gonna be some work that has to be done, that sure. concept might not get materialized. And so I think we're being able to articulate the pipeline as a set of transformations and what gets 
materialized into an object and when you would want to do that, right? Because like, if you want to do serial sequential consistency and watch a manifest work, you got to commit it to something. Um, but likewise, that's a right amplification because you have to take an object and then write it again to add CD or write it to some serial store and incur a, a right amplification of one at least for that. But well, if you have no objects on the left, you do need to materialize it in etcd at one point or materialize it in the store. So like, I, I think we're like, it's like we're, this is really good to see this because it can, we can kind of like map out what the pipeline looks like today here and say, are we going after unique ways of looking at this pipeline that actually would want us to take those chunks and reuse them in different spots? Because manifest work is a lot like a template where you could turn, like you could write a, a, a controller that looks at a set of Git repos and turns it into a template. We don't have a use mm -hmm. case for that. And I think the, the manifest work concept and the stuff that's in ACM and OC, OCM actually does better at that. There's no need to go do it, but like conceptually, you've got a good principled object. And then the question would be how coupled is it to all the other principles? Can it be used orthogonally? And the answer is so, so yes. And so, so that's no. a key point I want to get across is that each of the concepts that are in OCM are, are very loosely coupled. The fact that we have a subscription model that is GitOps aware that could use manifest work under the covers or a policy model that is not explicitly GitOps aware but can be tied into GitOps and use manifest work, how we configure some or how we configure thinness, all of these, you know, somewhat very different use cases can leverage this same primitive under the covers. And I think that's a powerful aspect. Uh, I and I, I let me actually close this thought as well about the placement. Um, again, placement is orthogonal. Placement and placement decision don't strictly know about manifest work and manifest work doesn't strictly know about placement and placement decision, at least not today. There may be some, some hypothesis that it may in the future, but it doesn't today. Today, we expect that a client is using a placement um, in order to define a set of objects. And because of historical reasons, bear with me, I'm gonna, you'll see placement rule Placement rule was actually built as part of our application delivery model. And we found it so powerful for use in every other example that we are in the process of translating placement rule into a placement API that's strictly part of the cluster dot open cluster management IO API group. Don't get too hung up on that. But the key thing about a placement uh, concept is that when I represent this, and I represent this API object as a consumer of it, all I need to be able to do is read what are the matching clusters that were selected. So the controller for placement rule understands how to look at the inventory, understands how to restrict it based on access control rules, and then come up with a specific list of target clusters that we want to deliver configuration against. From here, a controller can leverage the placement concept and generate the appropriate manifest work. The manifest work objects are cluster or assigned to a cluster based on being put in the namespace or content for that target cluster. So a manifest work, uh, if I'm delivering it to three clusters, I'm basically replicating it to namespace one, two, and three. And then the agent on each end of those three clusters is calling back and can only see configuration in the namespace that it's been allocated. So agents don't have a lot of you know, visibility to other peers through any mechanism that they go back to the hub for. So I wanna make sure that the concept here is important because, or the concept here is understood because it demonstrates how we can take a concept like placement and manifest work and you can use them. I don't necessarily have to create manifest work objects if I use placements. I don't have to use placements if I'm going to use manifest work to distribute configuration. And um, I think that's a so it's interesting too because I think so it's good. So uh, so then let's explore the idea here of um, one of the things I think you could say is that the cluster list the cluster lit today implicitly trusts that manifest work is accurate. So effectively, the cluster that is delegating to the man, the thing that is creating the manifest work as an objective source of truth. Yes. One of the things, and this is like this kind of models what the kubelet does. Um, the kubelet, like, and there's like a, 
the cubelet is one of the more complex controllers, but like it's probably most accurate. Like if people think about the cubelet as a very complex controller that's reconciling another API, which is the host level process hierarchy mm -hmm. poorly. Um, and that's not a, that's not a ding. It's like, if we could go back and do the cubelet over again, there's a lot of different ways that we might approach it. We lack some of the, we lack, we still lack some of the constructs to go do that. But the idea that you have a source of truth, you reconcile the current state to that. Um, like a great example would be like, if your connection to the cube API server's cut off, you have no local state. Mm -hmm. One of the differences between manifest work and clusterlet is in theory, clusterlet has already transformed. So like you could say like, that's the spot where the cubelet and clusterlet are different, but they're still both trusting, like here's the pod I'm going to run as root, trust it to do everything. The yeah. transformations, and, go ahead. I'm just gonna, uh, um, when you close that thought, I'll, I'll, let's talk about how we get to the registration of how we establish the trust. Yeah, and, and I think there's, um, and controllers, run through a variety of these, like most controllers trust their truth, trust that whatever they're um, reading is accurate, but then they have to impose a set of like, um, you know, checks. And sometimes it doesn't have those checks, like the APIs that we construct, like, cause again, controllers just wait for saying like, given all these mm -hmm. things are true, what do I make happen? The construct that I think is, is important to talk about when we talk about policy would be, um, when are the cases where a centralized model of truth or a single source of truth actually don't? And so I think a KCP, a workload exploration goal would be, there will be places where there should be hard policies that a compromised KCP can only compromise the workload. So creating that boundary, I think is something that like, the transformation step is it's not actually, it's about you don't fully trust the person providing you one set of manifest work and you compare it to another policy, that policy mm -hmm. could come from a different source or a same source or could be in code, like whatever that is. So that's one reason for a transformation step. Likewise on placement, um, the choice of how you do placement strategy implicitly assumes somebody who has visibility and decides to carve stuff up. I would actually say that's not really an assumption that I think in the transparent multi-cluster we care about breaking up you know, all these things have capacity share across it. That's very much like the cubelet as well. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, again, like it's it's not saying that like um, we can't align these things. It's just saying, thinking about like where in the pipeline, the what are we trying to achieve is a little bit less of a pre-planned story and a little bit more of an organic story. But the organic placement is not so organic that it's not centralized. It's just... Um, the APIs we choose for it, we might have a set of policy APIs, but then we also might bring in other sources. But does it mean that that's not the same mechanism or we could reuse those And, those and that, that notion of kind of reusing the concepts, reusing, you know, even collaborating so that we define a, a unified way of thinking about and managing these things. I could, um, you know, we could envision a model where placements <clears throat> weren't created by the user of KCP, but were defined by someone who's defining a set of policy expectations. We could define a model where uh, the placement rules on how we evaluate and assign work is driven on factors that are less concrete. Today, placement rules, as they're currently implemented and as they've been implemented for several years, really are using matching label selectors, match expressions, and some basic awareness of resource utilization as a hint. I wouldn't I wouldn't articulate it as a full-fledged, you know, multi-cluster intensively resource aware scheduling behavior. But if you've if you've got 10 clusters and one has lower CP utilization, then it'll it'll try to select that one when it comes up with a decision. As we look at evolving this into the placement API, that API is much more opinionated about things like affinity and anti-affinity for spreading. It will ultimately be more opinionated about things like resource distributions and uh, optimization of resource management and likely other constraints as well. There's a number that are coming out of consumers like Ant, uh, maybe in time consumers like Tencent, because Ant has used open cluster management and deployed it to manage their Kubernetes fleet in production today, completely independent of any Red Hat uh, arc. So we may see their scheduling behavior, their requirements there become more complicated over time. 
And I say all that because if KCP is defining this more organic association of user desired state to actual running state, then KCP could inject new strategies for how placement decisions are calculated. Yeah. And still leverage and I, it. And I think that I think that that's like the the key tension is like um, we can if there's one thing that I think KCP as an experiment has to show is whether the idea is viable that you don't actually have to care about underlying infrastructure. So there needs to be enough of a hard boundary between the way that someone up top thinks about it and the way that's used. But the just creating that hard boundary basically gives us carte blanche to to add policy on the back end, but we need the right policy constructs. And like Cube, like Cube kind of suffers from this a little bit, which is we didn't really have a large set of existing, con and it suffers benefits, whatever. The Cube scheduler, right? Originally we said, oh, you know, we, we want relatively flexible policies for scheduling. In mm -hmm. practice, that kind of reached a certain point. And then there's people who take the scheduler and fork it. Um, there's a plugin architecture, there's a config files, there was choosing mm -hmm. the scheduler preferences. Really, the world is divided into the super sophisticated people who heavily fork it and they build their own systems, and everybody who just uses the default or like tweaks two things. If we had come into Cube with a little bit more of, um, I don't want to say prior art because there's plenty of prior art. But existing concepts that we could overlay or compose, there would have been a lot more desire to be able to reuse some of those, right? Like the ecosystems that sure. existed before Cube were, you know, people did this early on. They had their own schedulers that do complicated distributed. They built schedulers on top of Cube, but those didn't mesh well. A key goal is the reason why we're why KCP as a prototype kind of tugs at the Cube ecosystem is the goal is to keep most of the web in place. But to bring some of those same kind of like, could we go do the same kind of thing that Cube did, which was like a bunch of core primitives. You just don't worry about the details because most of the time they don't matter. But we have all those concepts, like you're saying, we have placement, we have existing mm -hmm. Cube scheduler things. How do we fit those into the web is a little bit of a harder problem. But the argument is a more achievable part pattern for reuse because in theory, we already have examples of how placement rules and these concepts can be used. If we can create that hard boundary between the application and the underpinning, we can reuse many of those same APIs as inputs to placement. We actually get something out of it because before we couldn't reuse much of it because they were all, mm -hmm. there were, there was a whole bunch of concepts you had to take at once. Like if you took a monolithic scheduler and tried to layer it on top of cube in the early days of cube, you were bringing, you know, tens of thousands of concepts that were completely orthogonal. In this case, placement, as you say, is already kind of. So I think that's good that like, well, that's another and, and wrinkle. And really, the there's a lot of intentional mirroring. I mean, as you'll recognize in this picture, yeah. even the registration flow for Flusterlet, we take effectively a uh, kube config that has a token for a service account whose only real permission is the ability to create a certificate signing request. And the registration controller uses that to create the CSR. There's an approval flow where the hub can establish that it trusts the identity of the agent that it is requesting to connect. And there is a separate decision point where the administrator can then allow that cluster to join the hub. And once that happens, then the registration controller can generate a kubeconfig secret for an identity that can discover information from the assigned project or namespace and do things like generate leases, uh, introspect manifest work, uh, consume add-ons, et cetera. But this registration flow very much mimics. And in fact, if you uh, don't have the managed cluster pre-created, the registration controller will actually create it on your behalf, much in the way that like a kubelet is going through a CSR process to have a node join a cluster, right? It's intentionally kind of following that paradigm pattern. Um, and I like, all, and I like that, that, that it's a two-part uh, approval that that uh, unlike uh, kubelets registering and creating nodes like something also something in the hub also has to say oh I know you I agree you're part of us uh, KCP yeah. today absolutely does not have that in either direction but should uh, I think. and and I actually say it might even really so there's an open question here about whether we we actually don't allow KCP like let, let's um let's invent a new term now so there's um Let's call it application control plane, just for the sake of argument. And KCP 
is kind of like got a whole bunch of meanings. And then we have what we would call like a, a step down, which is like all the component technology pieces. But like, say mm-hmm. you have like an application control plane and an administrative control plane. And the administrative control plane is, uh, you know, offering a set of capabilities to uh, centralized control. And then there's a set of capabilities where like end users are the ones. So it's like, you kind of have like the, the low cardinality fan out, which is like, I'm making this available to you. And what I've made available to you, you can consume. You might then want to integrate in your own. So like someone wants to go get a service account and integrate their their own little slice of the world with a GitOps, right? So they want to go get a service mm-hmm. account token and give it to GitHub. GitHub's an external integrator. But the key thing is that you don't want to accidentally give GitHub a service account that lets you run root on all of these clusters. And so trying to like tease apart these two worlds, like administrative control plane and application control plane doesn't mean they don't actually use similar concepts, but this and flow it's is that actually- that I'm really kind of driving on, right? Is yeah. that we establish enough overlap where even though a user, and I'll flip down to, to this picture, even though a user may not ever touch a manifest work, and placement may be something that is underneath the KCP API server. Even if a user never sees those concepts, as a KCP consumer, they simply see this ability to deliver a set of objects to the API server. Magic happens, and on the other side, there's running workload. I think the overlap between the application control plane and the administrative control plane must exist because there are still a set of human beings who are responsible to keep all the magic on the right and as this picture is laid out keep all of that magic actually available and running yeah and maybe so there's like an application control plane and there's back plane that's another term that we've used Mm -hmm. one of the things that you're trying to prevent is accidental um, overlap separating out implementation. So you want to create something where people don't accidentally suffer a breach. So like Cube has this problem today, which is if I can create, like think about these as like, if you drew a threat model of Cube and you can, um, if you can create a pod in a certain namespace, or if you can create a pod that's root on a host, there's a little Mm -hmm. line on a graph between I can do this, therefore I can do this, therefore I can do this, therefore I can become root. So this is like the, uh, you build like your security graph and like we've talked about this in Cube of, one of the things that we really want to do is upfront snip the lines that result in people escalating, right? And the only way you can do that is if the actions you can do are no more than you can see. So like for you to do an action, someone has to give you that action, right? Like it's not a, an implicit part of the system. And Cube, we kind of did that for deliberate reasons because you needed to be able to run root lo- level workloads on machines. Um, that's a fundamental part. And within an organization, the trust boundary usually works for that. But backplanes or ap- administrative control planes and application control planes actually need to model that somehow. And even though those might be overlapping in API constructs, you still need to actually have the thing, which is I can't run yep. a root level workload. But I think this is like what we, what we're kind of like, what we're trying to get to is like, what's the application control plane experience and the administrative mm-hmm. control plane experience and where do those top level concepts intersect? So for instance, being able to edit my policy of placement would be inappropriate, but it doesn't mean that I can't use that placement policy as an admin, just not exposed to the user. But it also, exactly. it, but it could mean that we just are missing an API construct that sits alongside placement, which is the, the dual of it, right? So there's one which is explicit placement and the other is implicit placement. Um, implicit placement might have an API or might have none. So like, I wanna run this workload who am I is part of the input to that API. The act of determining who I am or what I set up might give me rights and then someone can come along later and fill that out in the back. Mm-hmm. I think all we're really trying to do is say when, so sometimes we have the same concept that applies to both people. So like a deployment or a pod could be used for great good or great evil. Um, you know, we can use pods or deployments or, you know, concrete scheduling of work. But the key thing is like what permissions that pod is allowed to do. And so sometimes you have an API, which is like a policy API that says you can't do this. And sometimes you have a thing yep. that's like, I want to do this. I feel like what we're trying to figure out and get towards is like on placement and maybe manifest work and maybe the managed cluster is, 
what's the dual of that for the application side? And the, moment the, the we, application we, side could absolutely either bring along uh, enough implicit behavior about how it wants to express its distribution, right? And for the sake of argument, that implicit definition of placement might really be tied to a desired level of SLA and redundancy, right? Mm -hmm. I yep. desire a certain minimum uptime, and I want to be able to tolerate this level of world-ending catastrophe, and I'm willing, you know, to pay more for that, or I'm willing to tolerate, you know, uh, two nines of availability, and you figure out the required distribution, and that's what crosses, you know, for this green object, whatever these are, through to KCP, and then KCP behind the scenes says, okay, here is the implicit uh, desired uptime and allowed error budget construct, and, and those are the only two parameters that get fed into it. It gets injected into a function, and out the other side comes a very concrete, here is the desired placement and placement decisions that should be used in order for this application to achieve its desired SLA or desired SLO, I guess, in that case. And then from there, um, okay, in order to distribute it among these three clusters in these three different regions, I'm gonna generate, I'm gonna package up the desired you know, ingress object in this flow, package it in a manifest work and let the agents go then reconcile and pull it on and apply it. And then just give me health feedback information. And if the health of those three clusters or their available uh, or their current uptime, whatever begins to fall below thresholds, then maybe this brain that is calculating, okay, translating an uptime into a specific set of actual clusters might dynamically reposition, rebalance, take it off a cluster, add it to a new cluster, whatever, as a result. And all of that can happen behind the view that the app developer has, but with a set of formal API constructs that an administrator can actively watch, okay, here's how many clusters are currently deployed by my system. Here is the help of those clusters as they're currently running. Here are the specific workloads and applications that each cluster is supporting logically from a user who never has this level of detail, but the administrator still has to do SRE on these things, right? And, and getting, like at the end of the day, maybe another way to frame this would be, Expecting someone to use um, pod replicas too is an implicit statement about HA. The implicit scheduling mm -hmm. policies in cube lead to that. The problem is, is that that's not sufficient and you actually have to go create a bunch of other objects to reach that. Mm -hmm. this, you have to create a PDB. Your administrator has to do the correct things with PDB. Your administrators have to not do things like force deleting pods. Your administrators have to set up, you know, your administrators have to do all these things. The thing we're trying to boil down into an app model is what's the, what you just described, Michael, of SLOs, the intersection mm -hmm. between infrastructure, the soft and hard constraints, and how approachable they are to an existing user. Those policies then have to get mapped into the underlying like hard rules and soft rules and administrative rules. Yep. What we're saying is we're really going to smush those together no matter what, in the sense of we're going to use both of those concepts to drive user behavior. So what we need to do in the midterm is firm up in a, in a dialogue or in a loop, identify the constructs at the application level that express that intent, identify mm -hmm. where the gaps are and existing. So like replicas two isn't sufficient. There's a set of implicit API. There's an implicit or explicit API that exists somewhere that should do the right thing for someone. And then how would that get mapped after we have those concepts mapped out enough, which is kind of like that short-term prototyping window that we're still in for the KCP, you know, get to a point where you can show that model and then show how the underpinnings of that roughly align with these concepts that we think, you know, are important, like placement and policy-based placement. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And and also, again, open cluster management is still a relatively young project where KCP needs different capability, like we can evolve these things. These aren't obviously set in stone. Um, placement is one that's under active revision because we're trying to take placement rule and transform it into a different API group. Um, manage cluster and manage cluster set 
more stable, but based on how users need more access scope and control, we may end up making changes there. Which is just to say that if for some reason um, the needs of KCP can't be met by what's there today, let's work on enhancing them and refining the requirements because I think we still will come out with a stronger statement if not only can KCP solve an abstraction problem and a security problem and a consumption problem and an ease of use problem for developers, but also whatever is on the other side of that facade is easy to actually manage for the administrative control plane or the back plane. Yeah, I think I think it's useful. Uh, like, I think it's a really good point to keep in mind that uh, OCM is not, you know, etched in stone and immutable for all time. I think it's I think it's worth going through the uh, the exercise of saying, like, here's what we would need to do to OCM, and here's what it would look like at the end of it to to like meet our needs. First of all, we need to decide what our needs are, but then we'd need to say, like, this is what we need to do to OCM, and here's what it would look like when we're done. Uh, or we can keep doing the keep doing the KCP things we, we plan to do, and that's what here's what that would take, and here's what that would look at the end, and then sort of compare and include the OCM community and say like, you know, it, uh, if we decide not to do where we're going with KCP and we want to do that with OCM, does the community want us to do this work? Does the community want us to make OCM look like this at the end of it? Because um, it's not just we're, we're not just going to impose what we want on them either, but like it's worth going through the 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 like. Uh, uh, comparison, because at the end of the day, we might find that the path we're on is the path we want to be on. But at least we have, you know, proved and, it. We, we've we've done the homework to say, like, you know, we are on the path we want. We looked at that path. We decided to do it or not. But we at least like had the the comparison for it. I think that's a useful exercise because I think and, the, the question keeps coming up, and I want I don't want to uh, I don't want to I want to just point someone to a doc we wrote, right? I just want to point someone to like we did the homework, we did it. Uh, but in order to do that, we have to write that talk first. And um, and, and I, so so I think at the heart of the clusterlet manifest work discussion is I don't consider I think like there's a third track on um, investigation of like what does a multi cluster controller look like, which I expect the clusterlet manifest work splitter sinker all to fit under, which is mm -hmm. it's not like we can't assume a single cluster as the source of input. And then we need to make sure that we have a set of scaling requirements for a pattern that works. But we roughly want to try to get to one pattern, right? Like if if to build a controller that works across logical clusters or multiple physical clusters is different, or if we need to specific, like, like think about this like a scale is like what we want to do is partition clusters. That is the fundamental like characteristic. And then there's a source, there's a set of sources of truth. Today, all of our sources of truth are singletons. The set of things that allow us to look at lots of sources of truth, but still get the benefits of a controller model is what we are trying to do. And specifically, that is how do you effectively write an integration which looks at like today we look at one source of truth with one API across, and usually it's, it's across all namespaces. So like this is like, you know, we go back all the way to OLM and like all the gaps in operators today. If someone says, I want to write this operator and only point it to three namespaces, they have no solution. So the, the arc for multi-cluster controllers, let's reframe it and say, I need to be able to write effective multi-context where context is a namespace, a physical cluster, a single logical cluster, single logical cluster namespace, multiple physical namespaces, multiple logical namespaces, or multiple. What is the pattern that helps that scale? The, the, the best outcome would be, let's concretely look at the things that we have today, but it's not enough just to go solve one logical cluster pointing to one. We really do need, how could I look at 75, how could I have a set of chunks of work that I can go look at and efficiently get a list watch across all of them? that I can then turn into effective work. So I think all of the things we've, we've said are necessary inputs. It needs to be around something concrete and real. But part of the reason to structure this problem yeah. as like a set of logical clusters is to open the door to say, OK, and how would you actually look at 7,500 logical clusters efficiently and translate that into the work that goes on one cluster or something like that, or, or the, the work that goes into mapping that to the AWS APIs or mapping that to and, 
part of that though comes down to partitioning and access control, right? If you're gonna have a multi-context view, there's nothing in what I've shown today where like the work controller couldn't be restricted or running multiple work controllers that source input from multiple sources. Like the controller today will do that. What you have to contend with is if registration controller one sourcing content from KCP logical cluster one and registration controller two sourcing content from logical cluster two. If those two inputs decide to conflict because they're both targeting the default namespace, that behavior today would be undefined. And so and understanding how to define that partition of the context is a gap I, that you know we could work together to help address and and provide more access control and scope. That's that's something that we often get asked, how can I define a slice of namespaces across these three clusters? Because a lot of current deployments stand up four or five or 10 big honking clusters and then assign the same three namespaces to this team on every cluster and these three namespaces to that team on every cluster. And today OCM doesn't effectively handle that specific use case. There's things we can do to help with that, but strictly speaking, like the machinery, you have to do additional work around it to get to that partitioning of these three namespaces on all yeah. 10 clusters. And, and you're right, Michael, like that, that intersection is how do you effectively define a context that some work happens mm -hmm. and you take namespace and context out of the hard requirements and put them into the soft requirements. I think like, the, the KCP problem of transparent multi-cluster and the, the set of initial inputs should expose one particular variant of that. It would be a mistake for us not to say, okay, and then we have another variant of that, which is I'm doing this mapping today, as you said, with um, you know a set of OCM use cases. I also want this, where do those two overlap? What would the cluster lib yep. need to effectively and efficiently be able to look at conflicting X's or the work controller. And then where would it store that? And the where it would yeah. store it would be, you have to have one place that you store something that's you know a source of truth that then people downstream can look at. We'll have places where we go through a funnel and we'll have places where we don't go through a funnel. We need the same outcome in both cases. So uh, yeah, let's, um, I would probably say even just that discussion, let's carve that off into the multi-context controllers. And we don't really have an investigation thread for that, but the sinker is an example of that. And the cluster lit would also be an example of that. And the work controller are three concrete examples. Yeah. We know we'll have a couple of others, um, like integrating cloud services into logical clusters. So we know that there'll be an additional one or two that really probably should be its own investigation thread. Um, and we should probably create an investigation doc for that that goes through the initial inputs. Um, and that's something maybe Michael, you and I can Kind of tease apart yeah, I think I think that'd be great. I think it'd be great. All right. Well, we are also at time. Uh, Michael, thank you very, 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 very much for your presentation and for uh, this great conversation. I will. Um, I have a couple questions I didn't get to, but I'll probably ping you offline, uh, and I'll uh, add notes and a recording very soon. Sounds good. And I can watch the community Kubernetes channel for KCP if you want to drop the questions in there. Cool. Cool. We'll do. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. See you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, bye.